Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading property experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, and Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investment Professionals of Australia, and the 2014 and 2015 Property Investment Advisor of the Year. All right, folks, you're on The Property Couch, where each week Ben and I bring you the insider's guide to property investing. Good old Collingwood forever. They know how to play the game. Mate, I, I was, not, only, not only did I predict that, Didn't I, put, even get I, hello. Put, I put a note here. Freo versus... No hellos. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Go pies. For those um, New South Wales and Queensland listeners who don't give a rip about <laughs> AFL... And, we get a problem, and, and I reckon there's some in Victoria. And, and, and we get else. a few people right in to say, just cut the get 40. Them. Yeah. Um, Clearly, Ben's team um, gave my my Dockers a little touch just, up. Just wanted it more. Yeah. So, um, but I I'm, I was prepared, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I knew it was coming. So, what's your return of serve? Well, realestate.com.au. Yeah. We shot a video. <laughs> yes, we did. And uh, you had a little sneaky one-liner at me at the yeah, end of the video. I'm off to watch Collingwood. Yeah. Oh no! Don't give, don't, give, the... don't, give, don't give it away. Oh, don't give it away. Right, right, yeah. So, folks, I was. Um, we'll have that up on our Facebook. The latest video in the series with realestate.com.au. Very good. The key here for all the listeners <laughs> is go and check it out to see how I got one back on Ben at the end of the video. So, yes. Um, and mate, you you bought a dog. Yes. Well, Jane bought a dog, yes. What sort? A, bl- a brown one. A brown <laughs> It was a brown one. Yeah. Uh, a- a- any extra detail on that? It's or got is it four, four legs? legs? Yep. Tail. Yep. Hasn't had a tail clip. I don't think they do clip these type. And it's got two ears, floppy ones. So how'd you let that happen? No. So, no slobber. Yeah. So I only had one request, no slobber. Yeah. And she doesn't like hair, so it can't lose its hair. So we've got a dog that's brown. Yep. That's it. You don't. You don't know what time well, it is. Well, yeah, Jane's fortieth present to herself. She she wanted it. The boys yeah. are happy. Oh, the boys are being Mate, tickle pink. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> Quiet life. <laughs> the um, uh, we're gonna get one next year because um, but I, we we toyed with it this year as sort of the Easter gift to the boys, mm. and um, I just realised that I wasn't ready for the uh, early morning cry oh, in the laundry. Twelve. Oh, last night, two a.m. in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my god. And then, you know, like the toilet training going on. She, like I come out this morning and, the, you know, there's three spots on the, on, on the floorboards where, you know. And so it has a name. Yeah, it, it took a while for them to decide on the name, but it's Bella. Not Deefa? Not Deefa. Not Deefa, Deefa Dog. Deefa Dog. <laughs> Bella. Bella. Chocolate Bella. Oh, look at you going all soft in your old No, hey. that's not my dog. Yeah. Not my dog. Good luck uh, to them. Oh, I'll so enjoy funny. it. I said to him, because I knew that. I said to him, Mr. Haggis, what sort? Brown one. <laughs> Just a brown one, mate. Right. That's uh, that's very, very. Um, yeah, you know, it's a you know, it's a it's a it's a manufactured thing. Can it fit in Jane's handbag? It better not. <laughs> it better not. Oh, I just did that on purpose. I did that on purpose. All right. Today we are going to talk about compounding, Ben, mastering the power of your money, yeah, putting your money to work, putting your money to work. So we've got a bit to talk about. But um, this week, you and I wrote some features for the Money Magazine. We did, and that is going to be—you uh, didn't know that, I was. No, we've been doing of, lots of work with yeah. money. So they got a, um, a property special coming up. So yes. once that's been released, we'll let them know. But we uh, we contributed to a bit of that stuff. But um, Ben, my mindset minute today is it's actually Tom Panos, who yep. says this a lot. Yes, eighty um, percent of winning is beginning, and Context of that for me is, you know what I'm like. I, I love writing these articles, but I put so much into it that I procrastinate on them all the time. And so in the end, I just had to say to myself, mate, if I just begin the damn thing, I've got 80 percent of it done. And it's true because I said I was, I'll just, I'll just get the rough aim, and then all of a sudden I'm off to the races. And I read it last night, and it was a cracker. It's so, a great article. So. Yeah, eighty percent. There we go, folks. If you're procrastinating on anything, eighty percent of winning is beginning. So and just start and it. How to build a property portfolio. Mm. So it's a really good foundation piece. I love it. Yeah. So check it out in money when it comes out in the next couple of weeks. Checks in the mail, mate. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> and part of that is every winner was once a beginner. Yeah. Hey, there's a couple of pocket phrases, yeah. Ivers. Even you, hey. You yeah. were once a Everyone. winner before you. Uh, yeah. You were once a beginner. <laughs> <laughs> you were once a beginner I mean, before you're the champion winner that you are now. Ed so. Sheeran, best pop artist in the world at the moment. 
He, oh. he, he didn't know how to play a guitar before when he first picked it up. Oh, don't talk about guitar. Yeah. Oh, you're struggling. Talk about push-ups. Or good. <laughs> don't talk about the guitar. No, don't talk about the guitar. Yeah, just to reach out to anyone on the podcast, how do you overcome just that lack of practice thing with, um, <laughs> with guitars? Finding the no, time. I just can't find the time. All right, so, um, mate, we are going to talk about mastering the power of money. Yeah, so, just, just money. Yeah. We don't talk about money. Should we build some context, Ben? Yeah, can uh, I start? Well, just to throw you? Yeah. Because I know you like, I like your structures. Um, <laughs> So GDP numbers came out, but there's also, you know, changes to how we're spending, we're saving money, I should say. Mm. So our saving ratio is sort of down around that 3 to 4% range. Mm. Now, it was as high as sort of 7 8% in 2013. So it basically means we've got a little bit of confidence out there, but a lot of people don't panic with that. That means we're still saving money. So generally we're saving money, but it is off the peaks of that. So that's a starting point. So if people are saving money, it means they've got surplus. The question is... What are they doing with that service? And can you save your way to retirement? It's a Ooh. good question. Mm. That's a good question. Mm. We might refer to that later. Right. Um, yeah, you did throw me, so what's next? <laughs> <laughs> what, why don't we read out one of the uh, listeners' questions? I think that's a good start. That was a test in your past. Well <laughs> All right, we've got one here from Chris. Um, hey, guys, love the podcast. I've told so many people about you guys. Out there flying the flag. One day I'll probably knock on your door for a job. Seriously. That's what he said. So just on that, Ben, a little oh, segue. Yeah. Yes. If anyone is interested in uh, working for Empower Wealth, mm-hmm. we have a number of opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, so reach out to us. We might get more on that a bit later. But yeah. I find that one of the biggest advantages slash disadvantages to building wealth can be determined as to whether you are or aren't on the same page as your partner mm-hmm. when it comes to finance and household spending. I meet so many people in life who are either money savvy to some degree or they just aren't. I love that we all have different passions in life. It makes the world go around. But wouldn't it make life, relationships, and wealth building easier if we all loved the concept of making our money work harder for us? We were all money smart. Thanks, rubbish Australian education curriculum. Mm -hmm, Yeah, well, that's it. Have have a dig. Quote, unquote, (laughs) with an asterisk. So my challenge is to you, not an easy one. Do one podcast that in the most effective mainstream fashion gives those that aren't interested yet just a taste of how they must be money smart because it is not actually that hard, how it can impact their lives so dramatically and how they should take a bigger interest in how to make their money work for them now if they want options of living a wonderful life. A life of experiences, inspire them. One podcast I can make my loved ones listen to, make, (laughs) invite, (laughs) encourage. Yeah, yeah, encourage. uh, To try and flick that switch in them to take more control of their finances with joy. Like when I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. I know how amazing compound interest is. I know how amazing leverage is, but so many people just don't. Therefore, they don't know why they should be delaying gratification. So they simply choose to spend. Mm -hmm. In a time that is crazy busy for you guys, building a business and living your own family lives and getting family pets. (laughs) Well done on giving so much back to society. You never know how great an impact you have had on generations to come. Chris, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Well, it's, he said, "Ask inspired the podcast. So yeah. today's so podcast is inspired by Chris. So let's start with the, the most powerful thing in the universe. We've talked about it before, the power of compound, Bros. So why problem. don't we talk about compounding? Yeah, well, some people might have heard of this, Ben. But um, yep. So the question is to the listeners, would you prefer us to give you a million dollars now mm-hmm. or would you prefer us to give you one cent today and double it? every day mm. for 30 days? Yes, that's a good question. Mm. So what, obviously naturally, we, you know, we've sort of we've put you on a hook. And the reason why we've done that is to basically, most people say, just give me the million bucks. Mm. But obviously there's a reason why we don't do that, isn't there? Well, Ben, there's right up until day 27, there's a reason why you would um, take, Still the, take, the take, million? take the million bucks. Yes. So on day one, if I gave you a cent, on day two, I gave you two cents, on day three, I gave you four cents. Day 5, 16. Day 10, $5.12. Day 20, $5,242.88. I'm not feeling it, Bryce. Give me a million dollars, Bryce. Give me a million dollars. Looking good. Looking good. And then I fast forward to day 26, $335,000. Still give me a million dollars, Bryce. I'm impatient. $544.32. <coughs> give me my million dollars. I'm still impatient. So, Ben, I'm going to tease you right up to day 27 because yep. $671,088.64. Up mm. until day 27, mm. you would have been better off taking your million dollars on day one. 
what about that delayed gratification? Take here, me home, bros. Take here me home. Comes. <laughs> Day 28, 1.342177 million. <laughs> but here, jump one more day, 2.6. Jump one more day, 5.3. Here, in fact, the total is 5 million. $368,709. And Ben, I'll throw the tip in, 12 cents. You can have my million dollars. I'll take your five. <laughs> no, too late. You've already oh, chosen. You've already I... chosen on day one that you're going to take your million. So power of compound. And, power you know, there is that video, the, the documentary on Warren Buffett, which we always have, you know, we've come across in the last couple of months ourselves. Uh, Warren Buffett. Becoming Warren Buffett. Becoming Warren Buffett. Yep. 99% of his wealth created after his 50th birthday. 95% of his wealth created after his 60th birthday. Wow. There so you go. talk about long-term investing. So that is the power of compound. Now, can I put that into a just into a context in regards to just 7% compounding? So that was doubling. So that obviously that was a, a significant power. But if I had $100,000, Bryce... Mm-hmm. And I had time. Okay, so we talk about we talk about our levers, in, income, expenditure, time, and target. Okay, and I got a seven percent return on that hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so if I started at the age of fifty, let's say, and I've got seven percent return, and I put that hundred thousand dollars to work, that hundred thousand dollars moves to one hundred and ninety-six thousand dollars in ten years' time if I get a seven percent compounding return per annum. Okay. Better than poking a stick with a sharp stick. Better than poking, poking a stick. With a sharp stick. If I've got 20 years for that money to work for me, Bryce, my $100,000 turns into $386,968. Well, and it's, not, it's start, working for me, isn't it? I'd start just, if I was you. Now, if I had 30 years, Oops. 30 years where I had 7% compounding return, that number has now increased to 761000 Two hundred and twenty-six dollars. Mm. That's just getting seven percent of my money. So when you put money into a check account and earn one percent or two percent, not good. You've got to start thinking about how you're making your money work for you. If you put it in an offset account and you're getting say four, four and a half percent, a lot better because also the you know you're not earning income, so it's not taxable. So it's basically pure saving of interest. So you're reducing that cost. But then if you actually put that money to work for you, and I want to bring the two together, I want to bring leverage and also compounding together in a minute. But do you want to talk to people, Bryce, about how cash on cash return works? Mm, in fact, we did that in the uh, the realestate.com video. We did, so, so check it out. Check that out. I guess what we're saying here to Chris, because we don't know if Chris is um, Christopher yeah. or Christine. Yes. So we're yep. just saying to Chris that your partner, first of all, Time in the market, mm-hmm. power of compounding. That's the first message they want to send. Then the, the power of um, cash on cash return is all about leverage, really, isn't it? Ben? It is. It is. So, look, we're not going to say shares, property, or anything like that. We're just going to talk about the basics, okay? And for illustration purposes, we're using a 10% compounding return. Now, that is a, a high number, okay? But it just articulates it's just the difference. Simple. Yeah, it's easy we're just do, trying to keep easy, it easy very to do simple. The at 10%. Okay. We've got $100,000, <laughs> we've got two investments. If we got a 10% return on one investment without any leverage or out any gearing, our $100,000 after 12 months, we get $10,000 return. So we make a, it's 110,000 in total, but we've made a 10% return on our money. Boom. Pretty logical, mm-hmm. okay? What if that $100,000 could be a deposit and we could potentially gear that money? So we could turn, we could use that money and also borrow some other money. So let's say we bought a $500,000 property. Now that means we have to take $400,000 in debt. Now this is keeping it very simple. There's obviously, if it is property, the stamp you and a couple of other things in there. So just want to make it for illustration purposes only. So we've got a $400,000 debt. So we've got an 80% leverage position, all right? So that means our return is now not on the $100,000, and this is the light bulb moment, hopefully for everyone, it's on $500,000. We're controlling something of the value of $500,000 of which we're getting a 10% return on. So all of a sudden, our return is $50,000 for that year. But there's a cost, because we can't just go and bother other Mm. people's money without actually paying them for it. So let's assume that with the $400,000 that we borrowed, we had a 6% interest. So that means $24,000 of that $50,000 in value that we've created has now got to be returned or paid to the person who lent us that 400,000, i.e. a bank. 
So that means our net return is $26,000. So our cash on cash return is 26% Boom. because we put $100,000 to work and now we've basically made 26,000 in value, which means that we've got a 26 return. It's a, it's a big return in terms of what it looks like. So that is really good. Now, I wanna finish off if I can, cause this is, this is my little, so I'm bringing bring it home, little, mate. Bring, I'm bring it home. It home. <laughs> I'm gonna bring it home. So remember that first example I used where I had time, you know, and I said 10, 10 years, 20 years or 30 years. Well, imagine if we could actually leverage so imagine if we could leverage that money. So let's say we go back to that example where we've got $100,000, okay? And we've got 30 years of time. Now we learned before that if we just got the $100,000 at 7% compounding return, that turned into $761,226. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's no gearing, mm-hmm. okay? Now what if we had 20% leverage on that? So mm-hmm. what if we just borrowed 20%? That seven hundred and sixty-one thousand turns into eight hundred and thirty-two thousand just with that little bit of leverage. What if we had fifty percent leverage? That that hundred thousand dollars over thirty years turns into one million and forty-four thousand six hundred and eight dollars. What if we had eighty percent leverage? Now again, I am not saying to everyone go out and leverage yourself to the hill because it's not possible for all people. You still have to cash flow management, and we'll talk about money smarts later. But at the end of the day, because we're borrowing money and gearing at such a high level, carries high risk, obviously higher return, so it's really important. But let's say hypothetical, 80% leverage over a 30 year period, your $100,000, wait for it, turns into $1.894 million. Okay, so that is a significant number. $1,894,755 $1,894,755 if you combine leveraging gearing. Mate, back when I was 22, 23, when this came across my desk, I was like, I'm very, very interested. How do I make my money work harder for me? Is that all? Just very, very interested? Oh, it was a light bulb moment, yeah. you know, like, tell me more. <laughs> so then what, what led me to property was the, the low volatility, the essential need that is shelter. The fact that the banks will lend me, you know, higher gearing as long as I was really smart and sophisticated with managing my money. Now, just a message, just shh, everyone. You can't tell everyone about this. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can do this, Mm. all right? Because if everyone did it, it wouldn't work. So, Chris, I know you want to shout to the world, but just keep it between us (laughs) that this is basically what you need to do, all right? Because the reality is you can still do it in other investments, and that's Warren Buffett is obviously the perfect example of that. He understands numbers and he understands the power of compound. So it doesn't just have to be property. It can be a multitude of things, but that is the power of putting your money to work. Oh, mate, you are a genius. Seriously, how do you live with yourself? So the, the point here for Chris is why should we be delaying gratification? Because if you put the money to work and the longer that you're putting it to work and mm. if you apply some leverage, the results are infinitely powerful. Um, that uh, I think. I think a side note with this question too, Ben, is um, some people just aren't motivated by money. And mm. yeah, look, I grew up. Um, like I find that hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> but but I but I get as I get a bit older, I meet people who just they they're just not driven by no. money at all. No. Um, no. So part of it here is you know ha- you know one of the. <laughs> One podcast, how can I make my love? Well, you can't. <laughs> no. But you can invite them and encourage them to see the power. But ultimately, the best thing you can do for you and your partner is to put some system around your money management, i.e. the money smarts, and then hopefully encourage them to take a, a little bit of risk in the leverage example that you've talked about so that you can actually get some exponential <laughs> compounding returns from that. I totally agree. And... Whether you are interested in material things or not, because you know a lot of us necessarily aren't. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not here to have the Ferraris and have the, you know, the the, the ski pad in in Aspen or anything like that. You just want the designer dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah, got that one. <laughs> um, the, so 
<laughs> I, I honestly talk, when people come in and have a consult with me, I have one question for them. Is anyone here under sufferance? Mm. Now, there is a reason I actually ask that question because like, the body language is there. You know, one sits down and they've got their arms crossed and they're leaning back in their chair and they're highly sceptical. And I don't mind that. And the other one's really eager. They've been listening to the podcast. They're trying to get their other partner involved. It's a few people nodding yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the reality is, it's like, OK, so their trigger isn't money, but their trigger might be time. Mm. Because if you have money, you actually have potential for, to free up time and for choice. So I then say to, to those people, we, we do need to have this conversation about planning for retirement because how would you feel if you had to work until you're 85? All of a sudden, those sceptical people go, hmm, fair point. So it's not about potentially super riches. It's just about sort of saying to yourself, if I wanna stop work, what is going to supplement that income? What is going to give me that opportunity to, to stop work so I can enjoy life? Because, you know, the, the beneficial um, advancement in medical and all of those things means that people are going to live for a long period of time. I mean, if we go back, you know, at, to our grandparents' generation, they retired at 55 or 60 and died at 62 or 63. You know, our parents' generation, the baby boomers are now living till they're in their 80s. Mm. You know, our generation, um, X and Ys, are going to live to their 90s. Now, that is 30 or 40 years that you need your money to work for you. And, you know, that your great money article just highlighted if you didn't want to touch the capital base and you just wanted to live off that with your rule of 25, check out the article, rule of 25, coming out in the money magazine. That is conceptually true. So you, if, you, if you're only going to build up a small wealth base, then the reality is you're going to live on a pension and you're going to be like the vast majority of Australians who are going to be whinging about you know, not being able to do anything. And you're, you know, your, your weeks and months are going to be about how you pay the power bill, how you just put food mm. on the table. Mm. Well, a lot of people don't see that as quality of life. And they're the, they're the people we want to reach out to. They're the people we want to connect to through this podcast in showing people a vehicle. Because all we are is just a conduit, an intermediary to share our knowledge, which has been passed on to us by the people who have been for the Noel Whittakers of this world, you know, all of those, the Alan Colas, everything like Jan that. Summers. Yeah, the Jan Summerses, all of those great people who have come before us. And we're harnessing that. Now, we're trying to improve the the efficiencies of that, try and understand technology and innovation to, to develop things like Money Smart, understand and develop things like location score and things like that to help people try and select a better asset and try and get a better return. I guess uh, Stephen Covey, uh, one of his seven habits is um, first seek to understand, then be understood. So mm. that's probably a good message for Chris. Understand, you know, which is a segue from what you talked about, understand what's important to his or her partner, and then talk to those. Because my wife is not motivated by money. She no. doesn't. She doesn't give a rip about the minutiae of the ins and outs of it. But what? My, so, my, my wife likes it. Well, no, no, no. She <laughs> likes nice things. But the thing is, she's not. She's not as motivated no. as me is to make sure that the money smart system is in place. And yeah. you know, she's very encouraging of our property portfolio, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But she's interested in. And so I talk in her language. She's interested in freedom, energy, and experiences. Yep. So I talk about Brilliant. putting. Everything that we put into place will buy us more freedom, will buy us more energy, and will buy us more experiences. And then I've got her attention. Mm. Yeah, and look, the state of your wallet plays with the state of your mind. Mm -hmm. So for some people, it's really tough. You know, and, and you know, those people who don't have really strong surpluses, there's still a road to a better and healthier and wealthier retirement. Um, those people who do have a lot of money, well, take pull a bit of it aside as well and you're also going to be able to enjoy the spoils of the effort that you've put in over the journey. I would say um, that uh, Leverage, which Ben gave a beautiful example before, is the independent umpire that solves all bar mm. you know, barbecue oh, discussions, Ben. Shares are better than property, cash is better than shares, I think we should go and get derivatives, whatever. My, I always just say, I'm a pretty simple bloke, just keep it really simple. If, if whatever asset I can get the most um, safe leverage on mm -hmm. is what I'm most interested in. And that's, we've talked about that off here yep. millions of times. That, yep. that we, don't, we don't love property, we love it as a vehicle mm. because of the leverage that we can get from it and the returns that we can get from that cash on cash return. It's example, productive. Talk we about. talk about it being productive debt. So, you know, the three, three levels of debt you talk about, you know, that, that's the main one. That's the one that sort of says, okay, in, and put it into a property context. 
If I've got a 50% loan to value ratio, more than likely the property is neutrally or positively geared. Hmm. So the property is actually covering the gearing through the rent. That's pretty powerful Mm. when you think about it. Now, if you go further and beyond that with potentially no um, depreciation anymore, you're probably talking about having to then kick in. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to go to your 80s and beyond, that means your risk profile needs to be a lot higher. Your tolerance needs to be a lot better. You you need to understand that by doing it too aggressively, you you could ruin it all and it could be a, a stack of cards on top of each other. So you just want to be sensible about that. And that's why we, we really do focus in on um, you know, cash flow management, borrowing power, asset selection, and defense. We're, we're, we've got that perfect circle of A, B, C, D that people need to make sure that they don't just go hard and get too aggressive and get too greedy. They basically bring it back to the fundamentals. And Ben, you talked about the cash contribution. Some of the um, some of the people that are negative as uh, towards property as a vehicle mm. cite the fact that why would you just keep funding this property that's um, that is this, um, a mm. money pit to use yeah. the terms? Yeah, it's because they're only talking from a ten year time frame. Because you showed it beautifully. Warren Buffett's demonstrated it that it's not until the end of the game and the earlier the start, the end of the game gets mm. even more exponential that the benefit of holding multiple assets. Um, you know, buying the right assets, correctly financing them, holding them for the long term, and adding to your portfolio whenever your cash flows allow. That's the bit that's forgotten in that discussion. So, yep, you do need to kick the can. You do need to make a mm. contribution. You are going to make a sacrifice. Can I spend that on my latte or do I put it towards a property? But ultimately, if you're playing the long game and you stick around for long enough, it just it's infinitely, yeah. um, infinitely better off than having your cake today. Totally agree. I mean, I- interesting last <laughs> night, I had a situation where I had a client come in um, and they bought a property not with us um, and the property they bought uh, settled in 2010. They paid $369,000 for that property and the valuation of it was $404,000. Right? And they have, they've had 100% gearing on that property and so they've, you know, once we worked out the interest that they've paid on that property, that one has been a very poor investment. In fact, it's been a negative return. DUD. Yep. Dead on arrival. (laughs) (laughs) Dud. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Absolute dud. That's that's what I love about you, mate. So, so, I mean... I don't know whether you're doing acronyms or whether you're doing... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we just stick to dogs, will we? Yeah, yeah. That's what we're good at. Brown dog, brown dog. (laughs) So... So that is, it looks a sad result. It's an absolutely sad result for that particular client. And so we've got to look at the opportunity cost of that in terms of what it looks like. So that, 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 Ivis is having a little giggle in the corner. Over oh, yes, he has to because I'm like, oh, is, is this an acronym? What no, just spell it out, Ben. It's dud. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It wasn't any more context. It's just dud. Okay, got simple, him. I'm a simple No, you're not. <laughs> so, so, okay, well, um, uh, next. <laughs> Okay, well, I think we now want to, so mm. we've, we've talked about the sort of two biggest things that uh, allow us to look at money. Now we want to sort of, we've got this great also message here from, um, who, who's this next from, one? From, from Greg. Greg. So I guess in wrapping that up, Chris, yeah. is the discussion is find out what motivates your partner. Mm. Talk about money management from the perspective of that person's why, what, what drives them, what makes them passionate. Because you're right, money management is about putting a process, having a system in place. Because it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, a dentist, a janitor, or a teacher, the money's flowing in, the money's flowing out. So it, it, it's it's what you do when it comes in the door before it goes out the door mm. um, as to will determine you know the difference between you and someone who's doing a bit better. Now, ultimately, if you get that right, Ben, you start as early as you can and you put leverage to work. That's as complex as the discussion needs to get. That's it. And, and then a few layers. Make sure yep. you buy the right assets so they don't yep. end up like your client. And the future sure cash flowing. Make properly. Yeah, the future stuff. cash flowing is where it gets a little bit more technical, but that's basically it. So, Chris, mate, you've inspired a podcast as you... Mate, you have, Chris. Thanks for sending that in. Hopefully that's helped uh, and hopefully there's been a few nods um, with uh, the rest of our listener base that can relate to that. So, Ben, with these realestate.com... Uh, .au videos that we're yes. sending. Oh, I'm sure that I'm going to get some feedback about the the one that's come out this week because I talked about leverage in very simple mm. fashion. Yep. So, but in the in the blog we go into more detail that Correct. sort of unpacks the interest component of it. Yep. But when we're portraying these concepts on the couch, um, we just want to talk 
top line mm. so that we can just evoke some discussion. Yeah. But we have evoked some discussion from the first one that we sent out, Ben. Yes, the first video. The first video. So uh, this is from Greg. Hi, guys. I just watched the first video you've done with realestate.com.au. Congratulations on the partnership and great work as usual. Just one comment on the first video. The savings investment glass got filled with what was left over. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't know what that means, go and have a look. I'll just put that up. This goes against many of the gurus, the richest man in Babylon, Robert Kiyosaki, etc., who all say pay yourself first. So in the video, the savings investment glass should have its share first, whatever amount the person has decided, and then the other glasses divide up what's left over. Keep up the great work. So Ben, we're going against some of the titans. We are. Have a look at this. Um, I did a little Google. Oh, nice. I've done some preparation. Good work. A little Google. The first, um, the, about pay yourself first. The yep. first title of the article that came out. Pay yourself first. The winning strategy to starting a savings plan. Mm. And then, as I said, we're up against some of the titans. Robert Kiyosaki, number four on his 10 key tips to becoming financially free. Mm -hmm. Number four is what? Pay yourself first. Okay. So even Kiyosaki says it. What about Dave Ramsey? He's got a huge following in the States. He does. Savings must become a priority, not just a thought. Pay yourself first. The richest man in Babylon, which Greg refers to, a part of all you earn is yours to keep. Pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. And if that wasn't uh, enough, we've got um, Warren Buffett. You don't want to go against Warren Buffett then. <laughs> so we better, we better, oh, we better be able to back ourselves up. Here, so we? here we go. Don't save what is left after spending. Spend what is left after saving. Mm. So, mate, we are up against it if we're going to go against that. <laughs> so we need to qualify it. So let's see if I can qualify this for you. So in, in the years and years and years of helping people manage money and look at their financial situation, certainly if I'm trying to save money, in other words, if I don't have an offset account and I'm trying to learn the craft of uh, a money attitude and, and money habits, then and I think we've talked about it before on the podcast where I have said pay yourself first. So I have no problems in the sense of getting into a routine and a habit of paying yourself for if you are trying to save Change of money. Yep. Yeah, because what a lot of people get caught up in is the plastic money world. Too much money, uh, too much month left at the end of the money. That's the one. And what's what's also happening there is because we see it in our account and we want instant gratification, we don't see it as you know physical money in our hands. We will get into the poor habit of spending it. And that's why there's $33 billion worth of credit card debt in Australia. <laughs> because people think it's their money. And then they justify it to themselves to go out and spend their money. It's not your money. It's the <laughs> bank's money. They're making money off you. Fire up. <laughs> so we need to make sure that we are being sensible. So if you were trying to change a money habit, I don't mind the idea of paying yourself first. Love it. However, when you're talking about money smarts, which is a holistic approach to managing your money and also making sure that you're living a little today, I know there's the, the, the delayed gratification, but in some cases, households can actually do both. Mm. They can effectively enjoy life, get the kids into swimming school and still have some money left over and when they've got that money left over, it's about putting that money to work. And so our system of money smarts is not about paying yourself first. It's about doing a breakdown of your budget and effectively determining living and lifestyle costs and determining where the build costs are and then working out a weekly amount that gets sent into a separate account with a debit card and you live to that amount. So it's not about paying yourself first because the, the, the goal with this is the money stays in the offset account. And so if you were paying yourself first, then you would be tempted. If, you're, if you haven't built a better money routine and better money behaviors, you could still fall back into that trap of saying, oh, that money's there, I'll spend it. 
So the reason why we separate out living and lifestyle into a separate account is because you've got to float. You, you talk about it, the seven day float, don't you, Bryce? I do, seven day float. You've got to find out how much it's going to cost you for seven days. And if after four days you blow the entire float, don't go back to the well. No. Make do for the next three days until reset button gets hit. Because once you build that behavior and that habit up, it's incredibly powerful. And you blink and six months later, it's like, oh, we've got a bit more in the offset. And what we've just talked about is if you can then demonstrate that ability to trap that amount of money, instead of having it in your offset price, what if you bought a property with it? Well, what if you had productive debt? Now you're talking. What if you controlled a bigger asset Ooh. that was growing with compound return? Got me sold. All of a sudden, that's the process you do. And what if you replicated that over 20 years or 30 years and bought four properties? Wow. Imagine. Game over. You, mate, Job nine, done. 91% of all property investors stop at one or two, Ben. So if they just implied what you said, they might be one of those people that get three or more. This is where we drop the mic and we walk off. Job, job done. That's it. No other podcasts to listen to, guys. You, you <laughs> do, that, that's, that is the science of what we do. Now, it does get a little bit more technical because we've got future plans, maybe private school fees and all these other, other rocks in the jar that we want to do. So when we bring it back to goals oriented financial planning, that's where all of it comes together. So because, again, I don't want you to sit here and living on crackers and Vegemite until you're 65 so you can then have your first experience on a jet plane. You know, ultimately it's about making sure that you are definitely enjoying life because there will be times in life where you have some hardship, there'll be times in life where you have some, some sorrow, where people die in your life and that will question your values. And those types of things are where people potentially have big change. They have radical change in their life. Now, we also hear about, if you know, if you're listening to podcasts and people say, how did you change your life around from being dirt poor to being wealthy? Well, I had this moment in time where I had $6 left in my, in my back pocket. And that was it. I said, I, I never wanted to be like that. And so these people, that's their why. That was their motivation, their drive to be able to change. But for, for the rest of us, it could also be in reverse, where we do lose a loved one. Um, you know, I was unfortunate to lose a loved one in terms of my brother's fiance. Uh, at the age of 37, three boys with my brother. Terrible, terrible situation. But I noticed some of our friends saying, that's it, I'm going to live life to the fullest now, because mm. you could be gone tomorrow. Mm. And it's like, well, you could also live to 100. And so, you know, the, the challenge for you then is, you're going to be working all your life if you do take this live now, live forever. So I think it's all about getting the balance right and making sure you're not too extreme in each angle. So Greg, I think it's important um, to realise that we, we actually agree with what you're saying. So we're not go actually going against no. what these um, titans of money management across the world are saying. What we're saying is we want to use that as a base and, and, um, and build some further context to that. To give an example, Ben, when you think about what's called the cup size, when I'm, when I'm a graduate and I have a graduate salary, I then have a graduate style um, rental accommodation, I have a graduate style car that I roll around in, and then I get a promotion, and then all of a sudden I go and buy a better car, and I move it to a better house, and I start drinking better red wine. And as I go throughout the cycle of life, as my income grows, I usually rise and fall to the level of my cup size. Mm. And that's, that's what we're trying to avoid through the money smart. So if you were to adopt the approach of pay yourself first, which is a good one, and I got a $2,000 pay rise, and it says pay yourself first 10%, I'm gonna pay myself 200 bucks, and then the remaining 1,800 bucks, I'm gonna lift my expenses. Whereas we're saying, no, don't do that. No, don't. If you, get the, if you do the system, the money smart system, if you get a $2,000 pay rise, and you, you get what we've been talking about for the last 25 minutes, don't actually increase your expenses at all. Just mm -hmm. park it in the, the money smart system and you'll get further compounding, you get further leverage. Because ultimately, if I get a $10,000 pay rise, the same thing. My mm -hmm. expenses are going to continue to grow if I only adopt the pay yourself first philosophy and spend what's left. We want to flip that on its head. But you're right. I agree that it's a very noble paradigm shift for people who don't even save in the first place mm. because um, if you if you pay yourself first it's just saying you're going to live um, within your means and you're actually going to uh, keep your costs at a point where you can afford it on the remaining 90 percent but as you get advanced and as you build some layers around your money management um, level of um, mm. literacy we think that there's another layer that you can go to which is money smart correct because if you do that you are actually accelerating 
the time in which you can retire. Mm. So if, if you were to say $1,800 comes into the pot and $200 goes to discretionary, as opposed to the other way around, save 10%, man, I mean, That's the compounding <laughs> the compounding nature of that either buying more property or retiring debt. debt. Mm. Because obviously we go through an accumulation phase and once we've got enough properties, it's about retiring that debt out. That is the powerful thing. So, you know, is it Mr. Money Mas- uh, Mustache? The Money Mustache, yeah. yeah. Like, here's a perfect example. He was earning a certain amount of money and once he got to that, he didn't change his living. And he found joy in building and, and keeping his hand and just, you know, productivity in life for him was about making stuff with his hands. So he's found his niche and, and the thing that makes him happy. Now, the reality is, is he's found also more money because a lot of people are thinking, wow, what a great story. And obviously, you know, we've got Simon and, and uh, Sarah, who we also know, who, you know, are in their early 30s and they're retired, retired yeah. because they have a certain standard of living that they are very happy with. But what others might say is frugal living for them is is complete happiness and yeah. joy, and that they, they, they haven't spent or their money's making money. They, they get, their investments are making more money than they're spending, and they're absorbing the criticism right now as they're travelling through Europe and <laughs> need to work for a living. Yeah, so. so it's all it's all about just basically exploring this idea of money management and and taking the journey that's most appropriate for you. Um, and if you've got a loved one, it's about connecting together and then understanding, bringing it back to core values, bringing it back to you know personal and financial goals, not just financial goals, guys, but personal. The money's got to mean something. Mm. If you're just doing it for money and money's sake, you ain't going to be happy. Mm. It is not going to buy you happiness. Mm. So you know, get to that sort of sit down, work out the goals that is going to be important to you, and then go on that journey and plan it out. You know, Plan to become what you plan to become. Very good, Ben. I think it's a really timely message because uh, people are now going to be faced with a choice. Depreciation changes have happened. Um, there's economists calling the top of the market. Mm. And so people are now going to be faced with that decision on whether they will still invest going forward because the front page of the newspaper yep. isn't going to be as friendly as it's been for the last 10 years. Definitely not. And our, and our suggestion to them is, is has, if they rewind to any of our previous podcasts, it remains the same. Keep accumulating uh, good quality assets at the point when your cash flows allow because your balance sheet will fluctuate over time, up a bit, down a bit, up a bit. But as long as the overall picture, if you're playing the long game, is it's much higher than when you started, that's what you want to do. The only thing that will fluctuate between now and the next 10 years is the amount of cash flow that you have available to invest. So uh, I think it's really important to heed this message at this point in time, Ben. Mate, I summed it up. Beautiful. Well, I reckon that's... that. For me, this is one of my favourite episodes already because I'm sort of thinking about, that's it. We've got we've got all the, the foundation stuff's in there. Well, all of our listeners have been around with us since episode one. We've built all these foundations mm. for them. So now it's just around getting, okay, reframed on the why, which you've eloquently put, yep. and then playing this out over the long game because... Uh, anyone who's been doing this long enough, uh, talk to Jan Summers, talk to uh, Craig Stevens last week, talk yep. to Brad Teal, talk to you and me. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, we've seen stuff come and go. We've seen cycles, um, but hang in there for long term. Just hang. Just make sure in any time when it's a good time and when it's a bad time that you make decisions based on cash flow, household, yep. rather than putting yourself under pressure. And some of those might be tough decisions. They might be hard to stomach, mm. like you know the guy last night that I was speaking to we've got to get rid of that property more than likely because it's not going to give us the return that we want. So we've been chasing all this cash and, uh, sorry, chasing um, potential wealth, but we've, we've, you know, in terms of asset selection, we've, uh, we haven't got a good one. Uh, very good, mate. You've been up and about. I've loved this episode, doing it with you as well, mate. So well done. A couple of housekeeping things. Yes. Um, we have got a location score webinar coming up next week, Ben. We do. Well, it's we're recording it next week. Yep. But it'll be available as soon as we get it nailed. <laughs> <laughs> So um, no, I don't want to put a date stamp on it, but obviously location score is 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 in in train, and that's exciting for us. So there's a bit to show people, isn't there? So yeah. where it's it's not easy just to say this is what you do. We're no. actually going to show them. So yeah. Ben, how can they? How can our listeners register for? Yep. So they just go to locationscore.com.au, and if they put their details in there, and we're going to ask them a couple of questions about what they want to see in the research platform. Look, you know, we've tied, we've made our final decisions in terms of what's going to be in that research platform. But guess what? Your information is going to potentially build phase two or phase three, or a whole new research platform that helps people get better at asset selection. So we absolutely love the feedback in terms of what type of data 
you want to get your hands on um, easily enough. So we, we've we make location score is a very simple product to use. We're starting, you know, to, as a catch all, very simple, pointing you in the right direction. Don't want to give too much more away, but that's it. So go to there, put your registration in there, and then Ivis will send an email out and letting everyone know that the webinar is now available and it'll be an on demand webinar. So that'll be uh, yourself and Jeremy and uh, yeah, well, myself, well, yes. and uh, we might even have Ivis having a little cheeky oh, she... giggle in the background, <laughs> <laughs> as she uh, loves to do. Um, and a couple of things, Ben. Um, uh, we've we've clearly talked about Money Smarts today. So mm-hmm. for those folks who haven't got the Money Smart system, how, for for those listeners who have heard us mention the Money Smart system, and you've gone, I've got to get around to that. I've got to get around to that. If that's you, if you're nodding right now, stop what you're doing. Go to thepropertycouch.com.au. It's on the home page. You can't miss it. Put your name there. Put your email address, and we will send it to you instantaneously, so you can start doing that straight away. Ben, it'd be mad if you uh, if you don't do that. Also, social media uh, at the Property Couch at Bryce Holdway at Ben Kingsley AU, and also keep an eye out for the Money Magazine that's coming up. Uh, should be out at the end of this month, Ben. Um, okay. Yeah, so we'll to for people to, to check that out and see. You contributed three or four times. I contributed three or four times. Yes. So there's, a, there's a bit of content. So, um, life hack. A little bit of a shout out to our community, Ben. Yeah, please. I, I don't want to do any life hacks that I don't implement myself. Okay. So, you know, I could just go, like my, you know, you liked my little um, uh, post it note on the keyboard. <laughs> I, actually, I actually have done that once. So, just so you know. <laughs> once. But, <laughs> several yeah, times, I'm sure. <laughs> several times. But um, so, a little shout out if they want to send me uh, any, on any of my social media. Mm, on, yeah. On, on, just let me know any of your life hacks. I'm, I'm actually genuinely interested because then I want to road test them myself, implement yep. them, see if I can add some value, and then I will um, implement it onto the um, love it onto the community. So let us know. And of course, Ben, if that someone's got a did you know that reckons oh, the community yeah. would you want to do from. my job for me? <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. So. <laughs> I wouldn't have phrased it that way because uh, <laughs> that implies that I want them to do my job for me on the life hack. Um, but yeah, so uh, let us know. So my life hack is for you and Jane today. Oh, okay. Because you're, um, I don't think you will mind me telling everyone you're in, in a phase of building at the moment your house. Yes. So you're not currently living in your principal place of residence. No. So you will at the end of the year move from where you currently are back into your beloved home. All going well. <laughs> All going well. Um, so Marie Kondo wrote the book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, Ben, and I've oh. read it. And I bet you just can't wait to get a copy of this. Oh, you, I, did, I bet you I can't wait to give Jane a copy. No, just here's the straight thing. Back Andrea it. bought it yeah. and then put it on, and I just couldn't put the damn thing down. I'm thinking, really, Bryce, you a tidying up book? But it's 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 for anyone who wants to tidy their house once in a lifetime. So what it does, Ben, is it says arrange all of your belongings into a category. Right. So... And Andrew and I have done this twice now, and it's really powerful. So we go around the house, and we grab all of the kids' toys, and we put it into the middle of the room. Not just not just the toy room. We go into the bedroom. We go into the living room and yeah. just bring it. And then we arrange them, and we go, okay, which ones are we going to keep? Which ones do we see the kids using, and yeah. which ones don't they use anymore? So yeah. we can pay those ones forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Marie Kondo says, when you look, so we, I've done it with clothes as well. Do you know yeah. you keep that loud Hawaiian shirt that you've had since 1987? Yeah, for think? the beach party. But what if someone says <laughs> to come to my 50th party with a Hawaiian shirt? The question is, does it make you feel good anymore? Does it make you feel happy? Or would you move that one on? So here's the point, Ben. <laughs> here's the point. Start with the easiest category, clothes. Okay. Then books. And then start, and then go all the way to the sentimental items. Because if you start, so you, this is declutter, or this is, this this is, is declutter and tidying yep. up. So you only yep. have to do it once. But it's you're in a perfect position, mate, because you're about to move back to your house. Yep. So now you could start to, you know. Well, here's the irony, right? Because it's a renovation, so it's not a complete rebuild. Mm. So we've got a truckload of stuff back at the other house. It's a good test. If we don't actually use it for the six months that we're in the new home, we shouldn't probably have it, should we? Mum rang me the other day and she goes, mate, we, you're coming over at Christmas time. We've got all this stuff in the shed. Dad wants to know, should we chuck it out or should we wait for you to get here to see if you want it? I said, Mum, I left Perth in 2002. It's 15 <laughs> years. I don't even know what the stuff is. Well, there might be a little black book in there, but there might be. 
<laughs> so I said, unless you can see some, uh, if you feel it's got some uber emotional value, yeah. get rid of it. Get rid of it. <laughs> so this is the point. We hoard stuff, right? Yes, it do. doesn't necessarily make us yes. happy. So start with the easiest category. Yep. And tidy wants to make the lasting change, Ben. So a place for everything and everything in its place. So oh, that's that's so you. Speaking my language. <laughs> but, but here's the tip for you. You have to let things go. So I've made a little underline for you. Oh. The 1990 AFL grand, mate, you might have to just let that be. Rubbish. Go. Have you watched it? When's the last time you watched it? When, yep. when was the last time I watched it? Yeah. Uh, 13 years ago. Yeah, probably. It's got to go, mate. No, I've it's watched it. I've watched it since then. But you what, can about my, it. what about my premiership you know, thing on the wall with all of the signed players? Do I throw that out as well? Yep. Oh, <laughs> no, that may be simple. That may be simple. <laughs> but the whole point um, is in discarding and keeping things mm. is um, to be happy. So the real problem is that we have far more than we need or yes. want, which actually plays into what we've been Does. talking about today. Priority. So here's it. Do you know how you get a double word in Scrabble, Ivis? I am getting a double life hack because this book that I'm talking about, you can read on Blinkist. Oh, which was there we go. Early 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 ones. Hey, double oh, word. No, hey. Double. Double word. Doubled up. So there you go, folks. The life-changing magic of tidying up <laughs> fellas. I'm telling you, that shed will never look as good <laughs> as if you read this book. So Imagine if you brought that home to your wife. Just the brownie points in, in that. Oh, yeah, you're going to I get mean, a brownie point with that, mate. You've yeah, got to be bring, sensible bring about vacuum it. vacuum as well. Well, you've got to be sensible about it. You've got to say, we're working on this together. <laughs> Don't just say, here, honey. My tip, my tip to you, mate, up. is you read it first and then oh, implement it. Yeah, then okay. you're going to get a brownie point. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But the blinkers, I'm, I'm thinking of you, mate. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. I've just clapped me. Well, <laughs> you are a modern Australian. Well, modern Australian, mate. Well, mate, Love. I often get in trouble with what I say on this podcast. So I've got to get it back. No, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Did you know? Did you know? Drum roll. How did it get to 52 minutes? A hundred. Seriously. And four quarters. Oh. A hundred and four quarters of positive economic growth in Australia. World record. We've beaten the Netherlands. Well done. One generation of Australians have never lived through a recession, a technical recession, two negative quarters. Anyway, that's pretty big. So we've now passed them. Now, sluggish quarter though, 0.03. So point, sorry, 0.3, I should say, 0.3 oh. of 1%. There's a but. Bringing There's a but the, to your good news. Bringing the annual rate down to 1.7. So we like to be in that 3% plus range. That's where, you know, most people have got full employment and the world's moving in a nice direction for Australia. But yeah, we are blessed to live in Australia. It's the best country in the world. Agreed. Um, you know, we go to work, we contribute. Uh, we have a great life. We've got some of the best living standards, certainly quality quality of life, standard of living, some of the best in the world. We're a very wealthy nation. We're very blessed to be here. So congratulations to Australia for uh, taking the world record for the longest economic growth story. Alan Bond, as he's lifting the wing keel, comes up. That's, uh, that, if everyone can see that, I know it doesn't work on a podcast with the keel. Australia. So there, I think you know. I know I did the lead up to that, but yes, it's official now. So right. uh, because we had that positive quarter, because if we had had a negative quarter, Ooh. interestingly, we would have passed because it's two negative quarters. But it wouldn't have felt right. No. Just wouldn't have felt right it's like if Steve, we. It's like if Steve we, Bradbury winning a gold. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was gold. Uh, where we get over the line and we had had a negative quarter, and then because obviously Cyclone Debbie was at the end of March, right? So the challenge is we might have a negative quarter for the next quarter. Oh. So we could have gone. We just. We beat you technically because our first negative quarter was the 104th quarter, yeah. but we don't have to worry about that now. Point three got us over the line, but we still have troubles in the next quarter, but after that we should see a little bit more. As quality. the executive producer used to always say to me on the show, Ben, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. There we go. There we go. All right, well, um, big, big episode, Ben. Yep, and I've got a, I've got a sign off now. Oh, I'm, yeah? I'm changing. Oh. So I'm not going back to languages. Oh, well, I've just, got a little, a little sign off. All right, mate. Okay, here we go. Because how I used to use it. I mean, our business has turned ten this year. Oh, okay. And we've so, grown up. So we've grown up. Some of the first newsletters that I used to write used to have a sign, <laughs> and that sign off was. All right, no, and let's, I, let's build it and up. I, let's build and it I up. do it Come in on. the books for some here of the books for people who want us to sign. So I was. So you know, and if you haven't bought a book, check it out. So the right. armchair guide to property investing. Okay. Well, um, um, well, it's been a great episode, Ben. So until next week. <laughs> knowledge <laughs> is empowering but only if you act on it. That's how I used to sign off. Knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. Oh, I like it. So the question is, is that enduring or is that just this week? Is that, is that well, every week? Maybe, 
every now and then. Cool. But, you know, All right. yeah, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it, people. There you go, folks. Time to act, and until next week, see you later. See you later. <laughs>